And this week, however, we're going to continue our Bible study. We're looking at the book of James. I think everybody's going to be blessed by this. Uh, those that are watching live, those that are uh, going to watch this later on video, I think this week will be a particular blessing to you. Amen. Let's just bow our heads and open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, God, tonight for this opportunity to be in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, today for uh, this place that you've given us, the house of God that we have today that allows us a place to call our own where we can come and worship you in liberty in the Holy Ghost. Master, tonight as the word of God goes forth in this teaching, we ask, Lord, that you would anoint both the speaker and the hearer. Allow us, God, not only to speak boldly and truthfully and plainly the word of God, but allow the hearer as well, Lord, to hear clearly that which the Spirit of the Lord would speak unto the church at this hour. Communicate with us. Communicate to our heart, not just our head. Lord, not just our hearing, but allow our heart tonight to receive that which you desire we receive. Master, today we rely so heavily upon that anointing from heaven. Let every word that's spoken be touched by the Holy Ghost. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We are in the book of James. And tonight we will be looking, I'm going to try to get through the entire fourth chapter if possible. And uh, we're beginning at James chapter 4. And the first part of James chapter 4, uh, the entire book of James, the entire fourth chapter, I'm sorry, of the book of James is James warning against worldliness and carnality. And he goes to great lengths to warn the church against worldliness and carnality. And look at some of the areas uh, that are identified as being related to worldliness and carnality. First of all, in James chapter 1 through verse 3, we read that quarrelsomeness is carnality. It's worldliness. And yet, it's so funny because this is an area that I know from personal experience uh, tends to run rampant in a lot of churches. Uh -huh. And usually it is born of pride and ego. One area that is very common in many churches for quarrelsomeness uh, to be common is in the musicians. I've spoken with a number of pastors who have told me over the years how hard it is to keep order and to prevent disputes amongst the musicians. Because the pianist thinks that he's so great that the others should be playing along the way he wants to play, and the organist thinks she's so great that others should be playing along the way she wants to play. And everybody seems to think that they ought to be leading the pack instead of understanding that as part of the uh, orchestra for the church or the band, however you want to call it, they need to be working in cooperation with one another. If that means that the organist has to dumb down a little bit, amen, in order to accommodate the pianist, then that's what you need to do. Rather than think yourself and your contribution so great that, uh, well, bless God, I can do a whole lot better on the organ. I can, you know, really play that organ. But if the pianist can't keep up with you, if their skills and their talents and their abilities are not quite at the same level as yours, then you may have to dumb down a little bit. Remember, you are there to help facilitate worship. You are not there to demonstrate your gifts and your abilities and your talents. But pride and ego are two of the greatest enemies of God's church. The devil wants to try to interrupt the worship experience. He wants to do everything in his power to cause uh, worship in the church to be less than genuine, to be less than heartfelt, to be less than in the spirit. I'm going to tell you right now, I watch a lot of videos on YouTube and 
what have you, and I see a lot of Pentecostal churches, and I can tell you right now, watching the musicians, I can tell you, they are not even part of the worship service. They are not worshiping the Lord. You can tell by looking at them. You can tell by the way they carry themselves that they are more focused on demonstrating their gifts and their abilities and their talents than they are on worshiping God. And it's sad because what happens is this is one of the reasons why the power of God is lacking in so many Pentecostal worship services today. Because, yes, we're in one place. No, we are not of one accord. Uh -huh. We're not of one accord. Right. There are, you've got the singers in the, the choir that may very well have been praying and seeking God, and maybe they're very much in the Spirit. But those in the band, those in the orchestra, are not. And if you're going to be part of the worship experience, if you're going to be part of the worship process, then everybody in that process needs to be in the Spirit. And they need to be focused on worship. I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of pastors that ought to tell some of their musicians they need to sit out a while uh -huh. and have one or two less instruments. Amen. Amen. Until that musician, that individual, let them learn to worship in the pew before they get up in front of the church uh -huh. and try to help people worship. Let them learn to worship in the pew before they ever try to get up and be in a position where they're helping to facilitate worship. Part of the problem is we get new people come in the church. And they pray through, they have an experience with God, and then the preacher decides, well, one of the best ways to keep them, bless God, is to give them something to do, to let them be part of everything. Oh, you've got a talent to play the drum, you've got a talent to uh, play the guitar, you can play trumpet, well then why don't you play in our band? Bad idea. It's every bit, the Word of God tells us, lay hands on no man suddenly. This refers to ordination, setting people forth for ministry. And the Word of God tells us you don't put a novice in a leadership position, that that is a, uh, a dangerous thing to do because it's, it's too easy for the enemy to come in and work on their ego and work in the realms of their self-esteem and their pride and blow them up. And next thing you know, they're backslid and away from God. When someone newly comes into the church, it is not a good idea to immediately employ them in an area that involves facilitating, listen carefully, that involves facilitating worship. It's not a good idea. They don't even know how to get in the spirit yet. They don't even know how to worship in the pew yet. Uh -huh. And you're putting them in a position to facilitate worship for the rest of them. Do you follow what I'm saying? But this is what a lot of churches do. And they look at old Pastor Charles and say, Oh, he's too old-fashioned. He's too strict. He's too... I'll tell you what I am. I try to be scriptural. I try to be biblical. I try to do things right. Because I've seen churches on a steady decline all because they keep doing things the wrong way. And then they sit back and it's like a person who becomes very ill. And they don't understand why they're so ill. And eventually churches become so sick that they don't know how to get better at that point. And the problem is, as the old saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. If you let those people learn to worship God first... Uh -huh. In the pew without a guitar in their hand. Oh, hallelujah. This is prophetic and good. I don't care anybody's head. You let them learn to worship God first in the pew. Let them learn to lift their hands. Let them learn to clap their hands. Let them learn to shout. Let them learn to dance. Let them learn to operate in the anointing and the freedom and the liberty of the Holy Ghost. 
Then, once they've learned worship as a participant, then you put them in a position to be part of facilitating worship. Otherwise, you're putting the cart in front of the horse. You're letting carnality fill your band. You're letting carnality, worldliness fill your orchestra. You're letting carnality fill your uh, choir. And we wonder why we don't see the move of God that we ought to see. Oh, here's this little preacher tonight in a church. Don't have a whole lot of folks. And he's saying things that Brother Manga needs to hear. Oh, my. He's saying things Brother Flowers needs to hear. He's saying things that old Brother Phillips needs to hear. But you see, this is where... The operation of the prophetic. I've talked about the prophetic. This is where the prophetic comes in. Honey, it don't care. It doesn't matter if God speaks through a donkey. That's right. If it's God speaking, you ought to listen. Uh -huh. And you would do well to listen. And uh, so many churches have taken a carnal, worldly path. And their worship has gone right down the drain because they put the ox in front of the uh, the cart in front of the ox and they put things in the wrong order they elevate people too quickly and in the book of james james talks about worldliness he talks about carnality in the church and the first issue that he addresses is quarrelsomeness which is Again, I've said before, I believe everything in the Word of God is written the way it's written and the order it's written. I think there's purpose and a plan in the way Amen. God has expressed every single word Amen. in His book. And I think quarrelsomeness is addressed right off the get-go because this is sort of what you might call a grassroots issue. Uh -huh. This is one of the first issues that you will come against you, if you've been planning churches like I've been planning churches for the last 30 years. And this is one of the first issues that you will come into contact with. Trying to build God's church. This is one of the first ways the Word of God tells us it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. This is one of those little, little, little tiny things that will creep in and the enemy will use it to destroy the church if he can do it. Uh -huh. We've seen it in our own church. Uh -huh. We've seen how somebody's personality is a little abrasive or a little unusual or a little difficult to handle. And I, and I confess that this is a fact. I mean, I'm not... I'm not even saying that, well, this isn't even so, but people act like it is. No, no, they are. <laughs> We've had people who are hard to handle, who are difficult to be around, who have unusual personality traits. And then next thing you know, you got folk bickering at one another. I wonder how many in the building remember when this pastor said one time, I don't remember whether it was a Bible study or what it was, and I got up and I said, folks, this goes on. We got people bickering and quarreling with one another when we go to fellowship after church. And if we don't fix this and stop this, we're going to stop fellowship and after church. Did I not say it? We are not demonstrating love one for another. We are not demonstrating what God has called us to demonstrate. And if we can't act right... You know, it reminds me of the parents, you know, if you can't act right, I'm not taking you into Dairy Queen. If you can't act right, I'm not taking you into McDonald's. Well, that's how this pastor has addressed things and said, folks, if we cannot act right, if when we're in a public setting, you're not demonstrating love for one another, I'm sure enough not going to put you out there and tell the world we got a bunch of bitter, arguing, bickering people. Little digs at one another are not acceptable. I know some people are hard to take. I know some folks have unusual personality. I'm probably the number one duck in the whole party that has an unusual way. And I understand that. But you know what? I can love people in spite of their difficulties. I can love because that's what the Holy Ghost does. Amen. That's what the presence of God in our lives is supposed to help us 
do. That's right. Love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if ye have love one to another. All right, now let's read the first three verses. I done expounded on them. Now let's <laughs> let's read them. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lusts, that war in your members. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own Lusts. Oh, my word, have mercy. I don't know if we're going to get through the whole fourth chapter. James says, where does all this bickering and arguing come from? Why do I hear that there's a reputation among you for bickering and arguing and fighting and all this negativity and all this nastiness? He said, don't these things come from your own lusts that war in your members? He said, isn't this based on carnal desires that are part of you? Mm -hmm. he, when he said that war in your members, he's not talking about members of the church. He's talking about the flesh, your body. He said, in this base, your ego your self-esteem, your pride, aren't these things getting in the way? Aren't they causing problems? Isn't that what the real cause of all this arguing and all this bickering and all this stuff that's going on that's negative? Isn't that what the real cause for these things is? He said, you want and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Oh, my word, have mercy. What is James talking about here? He's saying, in your flesh, you go so far out of your way to achieve what you want for you. I just talked about this the other day. I can't remember if it was in Bible study a couple weeks ago or if it was in Sunday's message. But I talked about people who uh, constantly strive to elevate themselves, who are constantly striving to be something and to achieve something. And, and I said, if God wants you elevated, God will elevate you. Right. If God wants you in ministry, honey, there ain't no way in the world you will not be in ministry. I, uh, the Lord called me to preach when I was a kid, and I told you Sunday I talked about it. And even when I was a young man, I had people inviting me to preach. I was not going to them and asking them to preach. I was not even offering my services to them to preach. No, if the calling is there, if the Spirit of God wants you to do something, He will make a way for you to do it. That's right. But James here is talking about the carnality of people who allow their own desires, their own lusts, their, the, the things that they want in this life and out of this life to dictate uh, how they behave and how they act. He said, now you got all this fighting going on in the church. you got all this quarreling going on. Oh, because this one wants to be the pastor and this one wants to be a deacon and this one wants to be an elder. And truthfully, there shouldn't be a one in the church wants to be anything. Oh my. Uh -huh. That's right. Did the pastor just say that? There should not be anybody in the church that wants to be anything in the church. But we should all be prepared to rise to the occasion when we are asked. That's good. My Lord have mercy. I didn't want to be. I didn't struggle to be an elder. I didn't, I didn't put on a campaign to become a deacon. But the pastor tapped me on the shoulder one day and said, Brother, I want you to be a deacon. I want you to be an elder. Hello now. Amen. The best way to keep carnality out of the equation is to keep your selfish 
carnal lusts out of the picture. So when the enemy comes into your head and says, you could be an elder, you could be a deacon, why don't the pastor trust you with keys to the church? Hello now. We ought to recognize right there, devil, get out of my head. If God wanted me to be a deacon, I'd be a deacon. If God wanted me to be an elder, I'd be an elder. If God wanted me to have keys to the church, I'd have keys to the church. There must be some reason that that is not the case right now. But see, then the enemy wants to plant further ideas. Well, it's because the preacher ain't in tune enough with God. That's why. That's because the preacher just ain't spiritual enough to recognize what a great person you are. And brother, how many of us let the enemy work like this in our brain and we don't have enough sense in our head to recognize, you know what, this is the devil trying to stir up division and strife and animosity and negativity. My Lord, have mercy. He said, ye lust and have not. He said, oh, you want it so bad, but you ain't got it. Ye kill and desire to have. So James is saying, you really go to some great lengths to try to get what you want. To the point that you kill for it. Now, he's not necessarily saying you literally kill. But how many people in the church use their tongue and destroy people with their mouth? Uh -huh. All in the pursuit of what they think they're supposed to be able to have and what they ought to have and where they ought to be so they could do what they think they ought to be doing. He said, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain from all your hard work. You still cannot get hold of it. Can you not recognize that if you put that much work into something and you can't get hold of it, that obviously, oh, God have mercy, God is holding it back from you. If you can kill, if you can struggle, if you can war, if you can go to all these lengths to try to accomplish something and be something and have something, and it still won't come to you. Children, I got news for you. Obviously, you're working against God. Uh -huh. My Lord, have mercy. Obviously, you're working against the will of God. Because if it was the will of God, you would have had it without having to kill, without having to argue, without having to war, without having to go to all these lengths. Am I telling the truth? Amen. He said, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to say something. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I'm going to say some things. There's a reason why. This passage just doesn't say, it's not telling us, well, you don't have stuff because you don't ask God for it. That's not what this passage is really saying. Listen to me now. <laughs> Whew, I love the Holy Ghost. I love the anointing. Amen. God says, <laughs> this is what the Lord put in my spirit. He said, you have not because you ask not. He said, and the reason you don't ask is because you know in your heart you don't deserve it. Uh -huh. You know in the bottom of your spirit that that's not something you really ought to have. Say, well, preacher, now you're just adding to the Word of God. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm paraphrasing because look what James says next. Ye ask and receive not... Why? Because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your own lust. So what I just said is in exact keeping with what James is saying here. He said you're asking for things you shouldn't even be asking for. Because your real motivation in asking for it is your carnality. Your real Motivation and asking for it is a lack of spirituality. Your real motivation for asking for it is in, in an effort to uh, puff up your ego a little bit, to help your pride a little bit, so you can feel like somebody a little bit. 
I could get myself into so much trouble right now with a lot of people, but I'm going to say it because I have to. It's my job. And I'm going to say it just plain as I can say it. I, I could go ahead and dance around this till the cows come home. There is a huge problem in the black church in America today because there has been, listen, I'm going to talk about the real root of the problem. And this is, folks, I preach in more black churches than I have white churches in my life. I have innumerable friends in the black church community. I love them. I adore them. I know many good, godly, decent, wonderful people. God called anointed people in the black community. But I know far more Far more, way more. If I were to put a percentage on it, oh, I'm going to tick somebody off. If I were to put a percentage on it, I would literally have to say tonight in the Holy Ghost that 80% of the people I know in the black church world who call themselves ministers, who call themselves preachers, who call themselves prophets, who call themselves bishops, who call themselves evangelists, who call themselves missionaries and apostles are people who have no business whatsoever, none, trying to be who they say they are, trying to do what they're trying to do because there is no calling, God is not part of the process for them, but they are trying to satisfy an ego issue. Yep. Trying to feel like somebody. Now listen, there is an understandable history. I remember talking about this with one preacher that uh, was a good friend of mine years ago, a black man. And he and I were talking about a book that he had read, written by a black man who had done years and years and years of research and study. And this man wrote this book and he said, in the post-slavery era, after slavery was abolished by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, it was so difficult for men of color to obtain employment Get real, honest, gainful employment. If they did find a job, it was some piddly little thing that didn't pay a whole lot. People didn't want to pay them. People didn't want to give a black man an honest wage and an honest living. And what happened was, it became the norm for many black men after slavery was abolished to go into ministry. Because, in effect, this was one of the easiest ways for a black man to earn a living. All he had to do was get up and talk good. All he had to do was get up, and as long as he could preach it till folk were shouting, then, honey, he could make him a good living. And it was all based on their oratory skills and their ability to orate, their ability to preach. And that's one reason why to this day in the black community you'll hear, oh, he can really preach. Oh, I mean, and the focus is always on how excited and how fervent and how uh, passionate somebody preaches. How, you very seldom, and we've experienced that in our own church. We've seen that in people who have come into this church. They spend more time talking about how excited I get when I preach and how passionate I get when I preach. And honey, the message is wasted on them. They didn't even hear a word I said. Because all they were focused on was how I said it. The message meant nothing. It's all about the delivery. It's all about how you deliver the message. And this has become a, a, an issue in the black community in America. It's been this way for many, many decades. 
And people wonder why the Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1970s literally changed their focus. And they began to focus more on the black community than any other community in America. And the reason they did this was because they found that in the black community it was far easier to find people who were disgruntled and dissatisfied and discouraged by preachers and pulpits to make money then they could find people in the white community who felt the same way. And you got to remember, Christian television had not yet become what it's become either at that time. But they literally changed their focus. And in the early 1970s, all of a sudden, the Jehovah's Witnesses began to grow by leaps and bounds, and it was all black people. Because so many people in the black community were utterly disgusted. Honey, it is to the point now where people have pastors that they know are charlatans in the black church. That they know he's only in it for the money. Oh, buddy, he preaches good. I get happy. Oh, I can shout a little. I can do a little dance. It doesn't matter to me that my pastor's insincere. It doesn't matter to me that my pastor's motivated by money. He's all, I've spoken to people and had them tell me straight out. Well, you know, my pastor, I know he all about the money. I know it's all about money with him, but, you know, I know it's all about the cars. I know it's all about the houses. I know it's all about the suits and, and the, the shoes. I know that. I know it's all about his wife being jeweled up and wearing the prettiest, fanciest, most expensive hats on Sunday. But he sure can preach it. And it's gotten to the place in the black church in America where it's so obvious. It's blatant. And because it has been an institutionalized issue for so long, many people in the black community either just accept it as the way it is, or they wind up falling prey to one of these cults that come along and their first argument they have, the first words off their lips is, well, the Christian church, so-called, it's really only about money. It's just all about money. Preachers are only in it for money. That's the only reason. See, they don't see preachers like me, and there are tens and hundreds of thousands of us that struggle every day. Preachers that work jobs and go to church and preach and feed the flock of God. And if it wasn't for working a job, the church couldn't possibly exist. The church couldn't even begin to afford them and support them. They don't see these. No, because in their church circles, in their community, all they see is charlatan after charlatan after charlatan after charlatan. And according to the book that Brother McCoy was telling me about, he said, this black man who wrote the book said, this has become institutionalized in our culture, in black culture. He said, there is, it is no surprise when a man in the black community wakes up one morning and decides he's going to preach. And that's how he's going to make his living. There's, there's no, no thought to that whatsoever. Nobody gives a thought to it. I see people, brother, that go online, and there are these organizations online, listen to me, that will issue you a doctorate in theology. And all you have to do is spend a few months doing their little correspondence course, and they'll issue a, you a doctorate in theology, and then you run around calling yourself Dr. So-and-so. Again, ego, self-esteem, pride, 
all of these things are the manifestation of carnality and worldliness. Does this happen in the white community? Absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. By no means am I saying this is something the white church is not familiar with. That is not what I'm saying. But I am saying that the unique conditions uh, in the black community after slavery wound up breeding this right into the culture. It literally just caused this thing to uh, become part of black culture. And when you watch movies and you watch TV shows about black preachers, you see it portrayed just as plain as you can see it. These men are portrayed as as carnal and as worldly as anything could ever be, but they get in the pulpit on Sunday and put on their little show. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yet, the minute they get out of the pulpit, they're talking like pigs. The minute they get out of the pulpit, they're talking like dogs. The minute they get out of the pulpit, they're lusting after women and they're chasing after boys and they're doing all this foolishness. And this is how and this is how this has become such a part of black culture in America that even on TV, they portray it just as plain and as simple as you can see. I, I remember, if y'all remember the TV show Amen, and uh, I was happy when it came on because I thought it was nice to see Sherman Helmsley back on TV. You remember him from the Jeffersons back in the day? And I was happy to see Sherman Helmsley back on TV but did you see his character on that show? The man's a deacon in the black church. He's as crooked as a dog's hind leg. He pulls every kind of illegal, ungodly stunt that anybody can possibly pull. And do you know what I hear from people I know in the black community? Oh, I know guys like him. Oh, Lord, we got a deacon like that in our church. Well, I mean, he crooked me. What? What? The Word of God says that the requirement for a deacon is that first of all, above all else, he be a man of good report. Uh-huh. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. This ought to be somebody who has an impeccable reputation. But this is what they portray on television. And people laugh at it. People get a chuckle out of it. Folks, people don't laugh at anything if there isn't some semblance to truth. What makes it funny is when it rings true. If you saw something that you ain't never heard of, ain't never seen, ain't never, had never crossed your mind in your life, you would not laugh at it. It would not be funny to you. Amen. Even when you watch America's Funniest Home Videos and somebody is... Uh, you know, walking backwards to do something, they trip over something and fall on their rear end. <laughs> we laugh, because what? We've done that. Or we've seen that. We've experienced that, either as an observer or as a participant. So we laugh. Do you follow what I'm saying? If it wasn't, if there wasn't some truth in it, it wouldn't be funny. We got people in church world today, in the black church, one of the things I've always had a problem with, we got to give every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the church a title. Good God Almighty, and if they ain't a title for you, we'll invent one. All the old ladies got to be called mother. We got missionaries. We now see in the white church, a missionary is somebody that you send out to a foreign land to reach people with the gospel. These are people who literally sacrifice their lives. They sacrifice their families. They move thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miles. They eat foods that are foreign to them. And they live like this for year after year, decade after decade after decade, to try to win people for Jesus. That's what we call a missionary. In the black church, every woman in the church who works as a nurse is called a missionary. Got deacons, got elders. And, and I'm not against some of the positions because some of them are legitimate. 
be deacon and elder of legitimate positions. But when you name people to these positions who have no business being there, you are not serving the church properly. You are not doing the work of God justice. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry I know. Oh, I'm a preacher. Yeah, well, I, I attend this church over here. Bless God. I'm a preacher too. Oh, I preach too. Yeah, because they're trying to make money. I have people contact me online all the time. Oh, I'm a preacher. I'd love to come down and preach for you. No, you wouldn't. You don't want to come preach for us. That's not your motivation. You want to come make some money. Why don't you say what you're really thinking? How many times have I said to preachers in our, in, our, in our circles, and I've said, I will come preach for you. Whatever offering you give me, I'll accept. Doesn't matter the amount. And if that means I wind up paying 80% of the cost for the trip, that's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm not coming to make money. I'm coming to be a blessing to you and to your people. How many preachers have called me? I've been in affirming ministry 19 years. It'll be 20 years in January. I've been in affirming ministry. How many have called me ever and said, Brother, I want to come minister for you and your church. I want to be a blessing to your church. It doesn't matter to me how much, how much of an offering you can give me. If I wind up paying the majority of the cost, it doesn't matter to me at all. I just want to be able to come and be a blessing. How many? Honey, few, very, 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 very few. Because for so many, it's a business. James says... Ye have not because ye ask not. You don't go to God, which is where you ought to be going, instead of warring, instead of fighting, instead of arguing, instead of bickering. You ought to be going to the Lord about these things. Lord, if you called me, then Lord, you, then Lord, elevate me. If you've called me to do this, then make a way for me to do this. Open the doors for me to do this. He said, you have not because ye ask not. And when you do ask, you're not asking for the same things that God would desire for you. Hello now. You're not asking according to the will of God for your life. You're asking according to your own will, according to your own lusts, according to your own desires, according to your own wants, according to your own carnality, according to your own worldliness, according to your own pride, according to your own ego. Hello now. Say that when you do ask, you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lust. Because there's some payoff in your flesh that you're seeking. Whoo! Glory to God. Thank God for the one church. Amen. We got some good, solid teaching going on around yes, here. We do. And it ain't because Brother Charles is so wonderful, but honey, I'm going to tell you what. I, I, I thank God there's a place where there can be uh -huh. some solid teaching come out of somebody's mouth. Amen. Because I'm get i going to tell you, I listen to preachers on TV, I listen, and it just disgusts me. The garbage that they peddle nowadays, the way they have watered down the truth of God, the way they've watered down the Word of God, it is heartbreaking. I remember a time when I was a kid when a preacher got up and preached. And honey, you knew, you could feel, thus saith the Lord. You could feel that, oh hallelujah, you could feel that anointing in their message that God was speaking to you. And I haven't felt that anointing come from very many preachers in a long time. And I do want to say real quickly as we move on in James chapter 4. Uh, people online love to make comments about the name of our church. Now, y'all know, anybody that was with us back in 2008, when we adopted the name The One Church, I told you, I said, I know this is going to stir up controversy. I know this is going to stir up. But, but, the name of a church can really, can help you in a sense to, uh, to get out there and to be seen and to be recognized and help people to see you and take notice of you. If you got a name like every other church has a name, well then you get lost in the crowd, just like a business, just like any business. 
And when we have first adopted the name, the One Church, I told our folks, I said, you know how there are banks that will call themselves First Bank or uh, 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 Bank One? I said, well, that's what we're doing, but we're doing it with church. It's an easy name to remember. It stands out. I can tell somebody, I pastored the one church. And you know what? Four months later, they can recall the name of our church because it's three small, simple words. And the first word is one of the first, uh, the, the main word is one of the first words you ever learned growing up as a kid. One. When you start learning to count, the first word you, word you learn is one. Am I right? So it's a name that's easy on the memory. It's easy to remember. It's easy to recall, which helps us. So if somebody wants to find us later, it's easy for them to go online and look up the one church. And I made a point of the fact that we're a one God, Jesus name, apostolic Pentecostal church. Uh -huh. Therefore, the number one holds an immense amount of uh, truth for us. There's a lot of significance to the number one Amen. in the Christian faith. At least those of us that are genuinely, truly, genuinely monotheistic. And I said, so the one church, I could go in so many directions as to why we call our church the one church. I could go in a hundred directions. Why? Because God's church is one. It's not divided by race. It's not divided by age or gender or sexual orientation or background or, blah, blah, or income status or, blah, 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 blah. or the one church. We worship the one true living God. We believe God in Christ and Jesus is his name. I mean the one. So that name holds all kinds of significance for us. And without fail, people will read it. And they immediately want to think that we're saying we're the only church. We're the one true church. I said that's funny because I don't see the word true in, our t in the name of our church. I don't see the word only in the name of our church. Hello now. We are part of the greater apostolic Pentecostal movement, which is worldwide. There are millions and millions of believers. There are millions of adherents. There are hundreds of thousands of churches. We are proud and happy to identify as part of that movement. By no means, under any circumstances whatsoever, do we claim to be, by any stretch of the imagination, the one and only church. Not by a billion miles. We are thrilled that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of churches that preach the one God, Jesus' name, apostolic message. Amen. We are thrilled that there are missionaries all over the world who preach this message. We stand with them. They may not want anything to do with us because of our position on certain issues relative to affirmation and inclusiveness. They may not want to claim us as part of their movement, but we take our place in that one true church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the apostolic faith. Amen. So I just wanted to throw that out there for anybody who might be watching who has decided already, made up in their mind, well, they call themselves the one church because they think they're the only church. Not by a million miles. And this pastor does not for one second, honey, I know a million preachers in this world, maybe not a million, but I know a lot of preachers in this world that I admire and respect and look up to, and I count them honestly, truthfully, as being far greater men than I am. So by no means do I claim to be God's sole and exclusive mouthpiece. By no means do I claim to be uh, the one true leader, because somebody tried to imply this the other day online. By no means. That is not what we mean when we say the one church. We simply mean that this church is all about the one. And our byline on our church sign for years said, the one we preach is Jesus. So the one church, we're talking about Jesus. Amen. Uh -huh. Let's move on with our Bible study. I had to throw that out there, okay? James then talks about another issue that is related to worldliness and carnality. It is the issue of 
spiritual unfaithfulness, what we would call spiritual adultery. In verse 4 he said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Let me clarify for you. This is not saying that you cannot have friendships with ungodly people or unsafe people. This is not talking about not having acquaintances who are not part of the faith and are not part of the church. That is not what James is talking about. Listen to me now, because you have to take James chapter 4 in context. What was he just talking about leading up to verse 4? He was talking about attitudes... He was talking about carnality in our spirit that's born of pride, that's born of ego, that's born of trying to pad our own self-esteem. He was talking about carnality and worldliness in our spirit. Now, he says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. He said, listen, you cannot have worldly attitudes and a worldly spirit and worldly motivations and carnal things in your spirit and in your life and think that you somehow are a friend of God. Uh-huh. When the church has people in it and preachers have the same carnal mindsets and attitudes that the world has, then they are a friend of the world. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And James says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Honey, when you come into the house of God, things ought to immediately look and feel very different uh -huh. than they do in the world. My Lord, I remember a time when they did. Amen. Not because all the women had hair piled on their head and sleeves down to here and dresses down to there. No, no, no. I remember a time when you walked into the church and you could be the poorest, brokest, homeless person on the planet and people come up to you and start hugging your neck. See, they don't do that in the world. I remember a time in the church when it didn't matter if you were rich or poor. Didn't matter if you were black or white. Didn't matter what your background or where you come from. When you come into the house of God. Didn't matter if anybody knew you. If you're brand spanking new. You immediately felt love. You immediately felt acceptance. You immediately felt welcome. Go into a lot of churches nowadays. See if you feel that. See if you don't dress like they do or look like they do. Or come from the same economic background they come from. Or make the same kind of money they make. See if you feel that love and that acceptance and that warmth. Amen. No, too many churches have become friendly with the world. Meaning they've adopted worldly mindsets and worldly attitudes and worldly concepts. And they look at things in very worldly and carnal ways. That's what James is talking about said, friendship with the world is enmity with God. said, honey, the minute the church starts acting like the world and behaving like the world and being motivated by the things the world is motivated by, you become the enemy of God. Amen. You are committing, in effect, spiritual fornication. Uh -huh. My Lord, have mercy. I'm telling the truth tonight. Sure. Amen. This is what James is talking about. Friendship with the world. You, you, God's... God's church, our people, God's people should, should come across so different than the way the world comes across. And you shouldn't have to come into the church house to experience that either. Hello now. That's right. That's right. My Lord, have mercy. Shouldn't have to come into the church in order to experience that difference. No, you ought to be able to tell that difference when you meet them in their house. You ought to be able to tell that difference when you're talking to them at a restaurant. You ought to be able to tell that difference no matter where you are, what time of day or night. You ought to be able to sense and tell there's a difference. These people think differently than the world thinks. They do things differently than the world does things. Our Lord, have mercy. Let's move on today. I've been talking about this all along, but James goes into a very... Uh, purposeful study on the issue of pride in verses 5 through 10. 
Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. I've really already addressed all this. Because this is exactly what I've been talking about when I say there are people in the church who think they ought to be something. Who think they ought to be in a position. Who think they ought to be named this or made that. And I say, what you need to do is knock that desire out of your spirit. You don't need it. That's right. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. You know, the Lord will lift up somebody who comes to Him quicker and says, Lord, I'm not worthy. I cannot even imagine being able to serve as a pastor. I cannot even imagine being able to serve as an elder. I cannot even imagine being uh, able to serve as a deacon. Hello now. That'll be the one the Lord will tap on the shoulder and say, you know what, you're ready. You're ready. Makes me think of that movie, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, the third one, I believe it was, that we went to see that day as a church outing. We went to the theater to see it. And that little, they got to the point where there was that great wall of water. And there was Aslan and that little mouse. And Aslan said, once you go beyond that water, once you go beyond that wall, you're in my land. And there's no coming back. And that little mouse stands there and says, Sir, I don't think that I'm even worthy. I can't imagine that I'm even worthy. I'd love to see it. I'd love to live there. But I cannot even imagine that I'm worthy. And what does Aslan say to him? You're the very type. You're the very, that spirit you're demonstrating is exactly what I look for. That's exactly what I look for. The humility said, go, by all means, go, welcome. God isn't looking for people who have carnal, worldly, self-centered ambitions based on pride and ego and self-esteem to be elevated in his kingdom. He's looking for people who, when they are tapped on the shoulder and God asks them, calls them to do any work, whether it be a deacon, a, an elder, an usher, nursery worker. Hello now. Amen. They say, Lord, do you honestly think I'm ready? Amen. Lord, that's an awful big job. Instead of the fool who sits there for years thinking, I can do that, 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 I can do that. The fact that you think you can is proof that you cannot. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I think that was about one of the most powerful statements I've ever uttered in my life. The fact that you think in your spirit, in your mind, and in your heart that you can do anything for God is absolute proof and evidence that you are in no way capable or ready. I told you all the story when the Lord called me to start my first church. I was terrified. Not by fear but by genuine humility because I knew, oh God, what a great responsibility. What an enormous responsibility you're asking me to assume. And I was so fearful that I might not be up to the job, that I might not be up to the task. 
And yet God said, no, sir, I'm, I want you to do this. And I went into that responsibility, brother, with my, hung, my head hung low. I went in with humility. I went in with a broken spirit. I went in the whole time knowing that I had to lean on Jesus. Because I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that in myself, I did not have what it took to do that job. And to this day, I'm 46 years old. I started my first church when I was 18, 19 years old. And to this day, I know I was not ready in myself. I couldn't have done anything in and of myself. If I had even tried to do it by myself, I'd have been a fool. I'd have been out of my mind. I knew it then, I know it now. I keep telling the Lord about our church here, Lord, you got to do this. You've got to do this. You've got to help us with this. You've, you've, Lord, the bulk of the responsibility here is on you, not on me. Because what needs to be done is so much more than anything I'm capable of doing. The revival we need in this city. We need a church like the one church. I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk plain tonight, all right? We need a church like ours, and it ought to have 10,000 people in it. In this city. That's what we need. Because if there's ever been a lack for sound doctrine and sound teaching, it's today. And if there's ever been a need for... A church in a community that is going to stand up for right and struggle and strive to do the right thing the right way and do it God's way or the highway. If ever there's been a need, honey, Dallas needs it. Amen. If ever there's been a community that needs revival and needs a move of God, it is the GLBT community as a whole, but it's also the, the carnal, worldly, self-absorbed community that exists here in Dallas, Texas. This city needs, honey, they need a church that's a whole lot bigger and more powerful and doing a whole lot more than this little building and this little group of people can possibly do. And I know it and God knows it. And I say, Lord, for us to ever get where we need to be, you got to do it because there's no way in the world I could ever, I could ever, there's no way, there's not a thing in the world I could do that could ever get us anywhere near what this city needs. And I know that. James says, you think the scripture says in vain, you think, you think God just says in his word so he can hear his own voice that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? One of the most base, one of the most common attributes of human nature is the tendency to want what somebody else has got. Or to envy others. That's, that, it, 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 that's one of the most base. You take a baby that's not but a few months old and you put them with another baby and you put a hand in, a toy in the hand of one of them kids and I guarantee you that child hadn't lived long enough to learn nothing. But that base instinct in our human spirit is, oh, he's got it and having fun, so why can't I have it and have fun? Hello now. We look at people in healthy, solid, committed relationships. I wish I could have that. I sure wish I had somebody like that. I wish I had that. We look at somebody driving in a pretty car. I sure wish I had a car like that. We see somebody living in a nice big house. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I know I'm telling the truth tonight. Then the person in this room ain't feeling a prick of conscience, just a little prick of conviction. Even the preacher said, God help me. <laughs> oh, I'd love to have a house like that. Isn't that pretty? Oh, I'll bet you it'd be nice to live in a house like that. Lord, you'd have enough room. You wouldn't be bumping into yourself all the time. And all my junk wouldn't have to be piled up on the kitchen table. And hallelujah, glory to God. James says, folks, this, 
This is really, honestly, this is the absolute most base element of our human nature. Envy. That's why people sit in the church, watch the preacher preach, and they think, I could do that. Watch the Sunday school teacher teach. I could do that. Sure, you know why? Because all you see is what you see. I talked about it Sunday when I said, what's the difference? You don't see the hours they spend preparing for Sunday school. You don't see the time they spend in prayer. You don't see the time they spend in study. You don't see the preacher and what he goes through all week long taking care of the business of the church and trying to minister to people and help people and all the while being attacked and being accosted by people and being verbally abused by people and going through all kind of negativity and nastiness. You don't see all that. All you see is him up in the, in the pulpit preaching and you're sitting there thinking, I can do that. That's carnality. That's worldliness. That's part of human nature. That is not something that God desires in us. It is not something God can use. And if that has anything to do with your motivations to accomplish anything, to be anything, to achieve anything, honey, you need to purge that out of your spirit. Because it is in direct contradiction to God. But he giveth the spirit that dwelleth in us less than envy, but he giveth more grace. In other words, God can help us overcome that. God can help us to subdue that human nature. He can help us to subdue that, that nasty desire to envy yes, and to be jealous of others for what they've done and what they've accomplished and what they've achieved and who they are. Look, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is so funny because you hear this scripture all the time talked about. And we hear this passage used constantly in a certain context. And yet in the context of James' writing, what James is actually saying is this. He's saying, he's been talking the whole first part of this chapter about how our flesh, our carnality, desires things. And it's not necessarily in keeping with God's will. It's not necessarily in keeping with the direction God wants for your life. And James says here, resist, he said, humble yourselves therefore before God. Humble yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. What is he saying? He's saying, do everything in your power to keep the enemy out of your spirit trying to stir up that carnality. Submit yourself to God. Whatever God's will. If God's will is that I sit on this pew and not do a thing but worship God and learn for the next 30 years, then so be it. Amen. Hello now. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Don't let the devil, oh, hallelujah, don't let the devil come in and try to stir things up in your carnal, human, worldly, selfish nature that is going to put you at odds with the will of God for your life. Because he'll do it. Yes, he will. That's his job. So resist the devil. Devil, I'm not going to let you get up in me. I'm not going to let you try to, to get me looking and thinking that I should be doing this and I should be doing that and I should be in this position and I should be this and I'm a... Hello now. See, I told you, I've already talked about this the whole first part of this chapter. I've already covered the pride issue. So basically everything I'm saying now, I'm rehashing. Because... This issue was the biggest part of the foundation of, to everything James had to say in the first part of this chapter. This is the number one offender, pride. This is the number one cause of our distress. 
This is the number one cause of our carnality and our carnal desires and the worldliness that creeps up in our spirit. Pride. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you will genuinely, truthfully, truly, with all of your might, work toward submitting yourself to the will of God and the plan of God for your life. And you will put every bit of energy you've got into keeping the devil out of your affairs. The Lord said, honey, the minute the devil sees this person too sincere for me, this person trying to live for God too real for me. Because this, this guy, this woman, they, they ain't even trying to let me in on their parade. They're not even willing to let me come in and stir something up. What's going to happen? He will flee from you. After a while, listen to me. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to have to finish after this because I don't think we're going to make it all the way through. <laughs> Because we'll hit 9 o'clock and that, that'll be almost an hour and a half. So that's long enough. After a while, if you'll submit yourself to God and you'll resist the enemy trying to creep in and stir things up in your carnal spirit, you know what happens? This walk becomes easier. Hello now. This walk becomes easier. Because I'm going to tell you something. The devil only messes with people. Oh, I love the Holy Ghost. I love the anointing. The Lord puts little thoughts in my spirit, just touches me. I can't even hardly say them. I want to shout. And this is what the Holy Ghost just spoke to my spirit. He said, the devil only messes with people who can be easily messed with. <laughs> Woo, glory. Anybody that puts up the least bit of resistance, he don't want to be bothered with you. Our enemy today, folks, is a lazy enemy. He only wants to mess with people who can be easily messed with. If you put the least bit of resistance up, people get mad at this preacher because on Facebook I say things like, we ought to resist the temptation to use titles. We ought to resist the temptation to seek out positions. And, oh, and I get a bunch of people writing me all this stuff. Bless God. But what they don't understand is what I'm teaching and what I'm saying is resist the devil and he will flee from you. Cut him off at the pass. Set up standards in your life that are such that it cuts the devil off before he even has a chance to start messing with your spirit and stirring up your pride and causing issues to arise. If you establish certain boundaries and standards. That's why I said the preacher who ordained me back in 1994. He got up during the ordination service. And he said, I believe Brother Charles is an apostle and a prophet and an evangelist and a pastor and a teacher. And I believe he, he uh, fulfills all five of these offices. And, blah, blah, blah. and I told him, mm -mm, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. No, sir, don't even go there. Don't even go there. Don't even try. Why? If I let him, I'm giving that much room to the devil. But it's my job to what? Resist the devil. I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot easier to stay humble before the Lord if you set up some rules and some regulations and some boundaries and some standards in your life that help to cut the devil off at the pass. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's right. What kind of rule? What kind of standard? Somebody come up to you and say, well, brother, well, you ought to be doing thus and so. You ought to be thus and such. Well, thank you, that's very sweet, but I, no, I don't think so. Make up in your mind ahead of time. Hello now. Make it up in your mind ahead of time when somebody comes along. For all you know, the enemy trying to use them to inflate your ego, to inflate your pride, to get you started. 
So what you do is you make up in your mind. When somebody comes to me and they start saying things, trying to blow me up and trying to build me up, the best thing I can do is politely, politely decline. Hello now. And by setting that boundary up, by setting that standard up, you cut the devil off at the pass for it. Even He can't even get through the fence. That little fox can't even get through the fence. Never mind spoil the mind. Amen. People online will say things to me that I appreciate. I mean, honestly, of course you appreciate positive things. And I've had people write and say things, oh, Pastor, you're so wonderful. I appreciate so much the work you do. Blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I, I know immediately what I need to say to keep the enemy at bay. And I write them back and say, you are so kind. Thank you. That's it. That's all. Or you're too kind. You're saying far more than I would attribute to myself. You follow what I'm saying? It's all in, it's all in how you respond. It's all, and sometimes the best thing you can do is determine ahead of time how you respond to such things. Because if you determine ahead of time, when somebody comes and really tries to blow me up, I'm going to snuff it or I'm going to dampen it a little bit because I, if, if I don't, I'm going to give room to the enemy to come in and start blowing that little bladder up. You know how they slide a little fat bladder like in a car accident under a vehicle and then all of a sudden they start pumping air into that thing? That thing can move mountains. That bladder can lift a whole car up. But isn't it funny when they slip it under the car, it's just a little, little flat thing. It don't look like nothing. That's how the enemy works. Uh -huh. It just looked like a little sweet compliment. It just looked like a nice kind word. Uh -huh. But then all of a sudden, after a while, we get others who start saying similar things. And that little bladder starts blowing up. And then all of a sudden, we're convinced that we really are something special. We really are something unique. We really are something wonderful that people ought to really be. My Lord, have mercy. So the best thing to do sometimes, set up standards, set up boundaries. Have some guidelines in your mind when people try to come at you this way. That I understand they're being kind. I understand they're being sweet. I know that in their own mind and in their own heart, they think that they are just being complimentary and flattering and all that. But I cannot allow myself to own that. I can't allow myself to buy into that compliment. I've got to be aware of my own humanity at all times. Oh, honey, you're, you're very kind, but believe me, I'm no more human than you are. There's nothing special about me. Anybody wanted to could do exactly what I do. And that's the truth. Goes on to say, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify ye hearts, ye double-minded. Who is James writing to? The church. The church. He's not writing to sinners. He's not writing to unbelievers. He's talking to the church. What does he call people in the church? Sinners. My Lord, have mercy. Say, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Take another look at what you've been doing and how you've been doing it. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. What does he mean, ye double-minded? Well, those of you that operate in the spirit part-time and in the flesh part-time. Hello now. Those of you that operate in faith part-time and carnal part-time. That's right. The word of the Lord tells us a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Said, purify your hearts, ye double minded. If you find you've got a problem with carnality ruling the day one day and spirituality ruling the day the next, then, honey, it's time to get before the Lord and say, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I need to be in a place where I'm in the spirit, where I'm in, in faith, where I'm walking according to the will of God all the time, not just part time. 
said, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. What is James saying? He's talking about, let's get really sincere about pursuing God in these things. Let's put some real effort into it. Let's take this thing seriously. said, mourn and weep. Honey, you need to understand how serious an issue this is. This is serious enough that you need to grieve when the enemy starts coming into your life in this area. This is serious enough when you see the enemy starting to come in. This is introducing death into your spirit. You ought to be mourning. You ought to be grieving. You ought to be weeping. You ought to be seeking God. Lord have mercy. That's where good altar services come from. Amen. When people see the enemy trying to creep into their life in some little corner, some little crevice, some little crack. And they say, oh God, I see how the enemy's trying to gain advantage in my life. Help me, Jesus. Help me, God. Help. That's why I just preached on it Sunday. Uh -huh. Just talked about it Sunday. Are my priorities right? Are you first or what's first? What have I allowed to be first in my life when I should keep you first at all times when the kingdom of God, the work of God ought always to be my primary objective and all else ought to be secondary, even right down to feeding, putting food in my mouth and putting clothes on my back and putting a roof over my head the kingdom of God ought to be my first thought and priority oh my Lord have mercy Whew. Jesus, even the preacher starting to feel conviction I, I might better stop preaching or I'm going to be all convicted Amen. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. James finishes in verse 10. And he will lift you up. The further down you put yourself, the higher God can lift you up. The higher you try to lift yourself, the further down you will find yourself. Pride cometh before a fall. The more you work and war and struggle, James says, to try to elevate yourself, you will just find yourself deeper and deeper and deeper in a ditch of carnality and worldliness that will overwhelm your soul. And you may achieve something in the flesh. You may accomplish something in the flesh. But honey, you will have lost the war in your spirit. I told you, there are preachers today that have gone out of their way. God never called them to preach, but they got out there and preached because they wanted to make a buck. And you know what, Jack? They've built big ministries. They've got television ministries. They make millions of dollars. They've got houses. They've got cars. But they're lost. They're unsaved. They're headed for hell. Because while they think they've got the wool pulled over God's eyes, they haven't got, fooled, they haven't got the Lord fooled in the least. He knows the condition of their soul. He knows what motivates them. He knows they don't preach for the, for the salvation of the lost. They don't preach for the benefit of God's people. They do so so they can have in this world and in this life the things that they lust after. Oh, you can fight in war and do all these things and actually accomplish something in the flesh and yet in the spirit lose everything. That's why the word of God said, what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? What, what are you willing to trade? Houses, lands, money, fame, celebrity. What? What's your price? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? and lose his own soul. There are preachers, folks. There are ministers out there who are lost today. Unsaved, unregenerate, unrepentant. And they don't even have a clue because they have allowed that carnality to sweep through their soul and they never made any effort to cut it off at the past. They never made any effort to resist the devil. Hello now. They never made any effort to humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. No, because humbling yourself requires 
Oh, my Lord, have mercy. And I'm closing up tonight. Humbling yourself requires you got to be somewhere you don't necessarily want to be. Humbling yourself requires you got to do something you don't necessarily want to do. Pastor Charles has to humble himself every single time I walk in this building. I'd love to have a whole lot more people. I'd love to have a whole lot more resources. I'd love to be able to do a whole lot more for a whole lot more people. Now, thank God I don't have any desires to be a celebrity. I don't, and I can honestly say that. I don't have any desires, you know, to, to become something in the world. That's, that's so far from my spirit, it's not even funny. But I want so bad to turn the church world on its ear. I want so bad to build an affirming movement, an affirming church that is going to set the mainstream on its ear. I want so badly to see God move in the midst of a bunch of misfits so that the mainstream church brother can be humbled and brought to its knees. I want so bad for our church to be able to be the bell sheep that will lead the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ universal, into a brand new era and brand new understanding of grace and the power of God. I want that so bad. When I have to come into this building and I face a small, much, 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 much smaller audience than, than it would be nice if I could face. I've got to humble myself. If I didn't humble myself, if I let my pride get in the way, if I let my ego get in the way, hey, I'm telling the truth tonight. I'd quit and give it up and say, I ain't going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I got people out there in the mainstream and in the, the affirming movement. I got people all over the place. Love looking at me, calling me names and making fun of me and have all kinds of nasty things to say about me and the work that we do in our ministry and our church and ha ha ha, we don't have as many people as they do. Of course, they got the most carnal church on the block, but that's beside the point. And the enemy would love to use those things to work against my spirit and work against my self-esteem and work against my pride. But see, I've set up little boundaries. I've set up little standards. And you know what one of my standards is? Flat-out stubbornness. I'm about the most stubborn mule you'll ever walk up on in your life. And I made up my mind as a kid. When God called me to preach, I made up my mind. I'm going to do this right. Or I'm not doing it at all. So you can laugh all you want to. You can mock all you want to. You can ridicule all you want to. Honey, when I face God in the judgment, I'm going to face Him and say, Lord, I did it to the best of my ability the way you told me to do it. Sometimes stubbornness can serve you. Right. Amen. I'm going to leave this for next week, verses 11 and 12, and moving on from there. We've gone nearly about an hour and a half, and we try to keep our Bible study on Tuesday to within the 90-minute time frame. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. I feel the presence of God. When you tell the truth and you preach the truth, the presence of God is always there. The presence of the Lord is always there. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, always, Lord, keep us humble. Lord, help us, Jesus. God, I'd rather humble myself than be humbled by you. Master, tonight, in the name of Jesus, help us, Lord, always, Lord, always to remain subject to the, your will for our lives and your desire for our lives. God, if we have yet still a small church here in Dallas, I accept that today is your will. For if you desired more, there would be more. And therefore, Lord, we simply humble ourselves in your presence. 
And if there be anything in us, if there be anything about us that prevents us today, God, from being able to realize the full promise of God, to, that prevents us from realizing the vision that you've given us, help us to see it. Identify it in our lives and in our hearts, God, so that we might put up boundaries and build fences and walls that will keep those foxes out that the vine might grow and prosper and fruit might be brought forth unto righteousness for your name's sake. Master, today, God, send us people. Send us people. Send us sincere, godly people. Lord, they can be unsaved today, but let them be of such a heart and such a mind that upon repentance, upon obedience to this gospel, they put all their energy, all their might into living for you and serving you. But Lord, if there be those out there today seeking a church they can work in, seeking a church they can be part of, seeking a church where they can do a work for God, then Lord, we just ask that you would put wings on their feet and help them to find this place. We need people today full of the Holy Ghost. We need people today full of fire and and vigor. We need people today, God, with a sanctified zeal and a willingness to submit themselves to your plan and your goal for their life. Master, in the name of Jesus, speak to hearts tonight. And God, I continue even to this moment, I continue to feel in my spirit that there are people all over this country that you desire come to Dallas. I feel it in my spirit as sure as I'm alive. And God, I just ask today, Lord, that you would speak to hearts. Oh, I would go if I didn't have family here. I would go if I didn't have this. I would go to help them, God, today to put the kingdom of God above all else and everything that appeals to the carnal aside, that the will of God might be done that the work of God might be accomplished in this place. For God, I believe the work that you're doing in this city is not a work that will be limited to this city, but I believe it's a work that is going to affect the entire church of the Lord Jesus Christ from one end of the earth to the other. Every church one day, every body of Christ one day on this planet will have some connection to the work and the revival that you started in this city, in this place, in this very building, with this very group of people. Oh, Master, use us, God, in a mighty way. Help us, Lord, to accomplish that which you've called us to do. For without you, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. We can do nothing. Master, in the name of Jesus, grant it, God. Help us, Lord, to take this study with us. Help us to take these truths and these principles and this teaching with us. Lord, help us to walk in it, not to talk it, but to live it. Master, in the name of Jesus, that we might be doers of the word, not hearers only. In the precious name of the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Even the name Jesus, grant it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Amen and amen.